Uh, I am going to talk about marriage and specifically our heart in marriage, but the things I want to share will relate to your parenting in some way or any relationship in the Lord. And uh, though if you're married, it's important that this is where you put these things into practice the most in order to be able to, uh, for that to overflow into other relationships, into your parenting, uh, into your friendships and community. But if you are uh, single or divorced, I promise there's no condemnation. Uh, You might be on your second marriage and I promise there's no condemnation. What's important is that this marriage that you're in last. And you, you, can, you, can, you can change by the Lord the future. Um, you, can, you can offload yourself of guilt or shame from the past. And so the things I want to share, uh, by no means what I want to communicate with uh, condemnation. But it is important that we take the word seriously and we take the standard of God's word and not compromise it to the level of our experience. You don't reduce the standard of God's word to the level of your experience. You acknowledge the gap and then by the spirit, you continually grow and mature as the Lord calls you upward to his standard. And that's no more applicable than in in marriage. Um, Proverbs 4.23, we're gonna go to Matthew 19, but the frame for that, uh, is set in Proverbs 4.23 in the New Living Translation. Very, very, very common verse. It's so common, we forget how important it is. Guard your heart above all else. For it, the heart, determines the course of your life. Let's pray. <laughs> I'm done. That's that like that... It's all about the heart. All the direction of your life is determined by what's in your heart. You can blame somebody else. You can blame uh, systems and communities and family and parents and negative experiences or trauma in your life. You You can offload responsibility for your life, but you are accountable for what stays in your heart. You're not always responsible for what happens to you, but you are responsible for the heart and how you respond to what happens to you. And so the direction of your life is determined by the condition of your heart. And as it relates to marriage, the condition of the future, the direction of your marriage is moving in the direction of the condition that's in each of your hearts. And so if you're going to work on your marriage, we can talk through all sorts of tools, and I'll I'll mention a a number of them, communication being one of them. Um, But all of that has a root system that if you don't go down to the deepest root, you can work on all sorts of stuff. But if the foundation isn't solid, you know, cosmetics of a building don't mean much if the foundation is broken. And the foundation that the Lord wants to solidify is your heart. And so if you want to change your marriage, if you want to change, if you want to grow or change in your marriage, it must be preceded by change in each of your hearts. And you're only responsible for your heart. You cannot control your spouse's heart. Now, this also can connect with your children. You have to guard your heart when it comes to your children, teaching and training them how to guard their heart, but you can't control their heart. You can control yours. And many people get frustrated and disappointed with their children and they end up getting things in their heart toward their children. And then it affects the direction of their parenting by sticking with marriage. If you want to change in your marriage, it must be preceded by change in your hearts. Okay, Matthew chapter 19. It's always good about any subject to hear what Jesus has to say about it. We're disciples of Jesus, so... What does he say about marriage? Uh, I'm going to read the New Living Translation, Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? 
Haven't you heard the scriptures? Jesus replied. I always, man, it's just my favorite. If a Pharisee is trying to like, I, 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 like insults is within the realm of Jesus's conversational techniques. They tried to trap him. He never insulted, you know, broken and hurting people. It was the Bible scholars that tried to trap him. And then he insults them. Haven't you read the scriptures? <laughs> Praise God. Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, so he, he refers to scripture as authority and he goes to early precedent, law of first mention. God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. And then this is now his additional commentary on Genesis 2. He says, since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So that's Jesus's commentary on early scriptural precedent that the two become one. And he says, since they are no longer two, but one, let no one separate or split apart what God has joined together. Not that common law has joined together, not what legal precedent has joined together, not what court documentation has joined together, not what bank accounts joined, to, what God has joined together. Then they responded, then why did Moses say in the law that a man... They got on their heels, and so they're trying to make their defense. Then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they ask. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. So Jesus appealed to God's original intent, not to additional concessions, and even in appealing to original intent, of course, Jesus is compassionate and merciful for all of us who've fallen short. And any of us that have, have gone through difficult things, or if any of you have, have had a divorce, there's no condemnation to that. But again, Jesus is not reducing God's standards based on human hard hearts. And so what Jesus is saying is the reason for divorce is not your spouse. It's your heart. Where does divorce come from? Hard hearts. The condition of your heart is determining the direction of your marriage. Wow, I didn't think I'd get that serious that quick. So what Jesus is saying here, married couples are more together than they were separately as singles. That the new unit of marriage that God joins together is more than the sum of its parts. He breaks laws of math and one plus one is one. In this covenant of marriage, one plus one is one. We have, we have a rule in our house. First of all, rule 1.1 is no slime. That stuff's of the devil. <laughs> now, unless you're a free spirit that doesn't care that everything you own gets ruined by slime, or you're ignorant and I'm saving you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. <laughs> cheap slime, it's, it's, it's a trick, okay? Slime is cheap and kids love it. It gets everywhere and you can't get it out, okay? So if you don't know that, send me a thank you card and a small donation <laughs> because I'm saving you tons and tons of money. So that's rule 1.1. Okay, rule 1.2, when it comes to Play-Doh, Okay, now Plato actually can come out of carpet. You just have to catch it before it hardens. Okay, but we have a rule. 
don't mix the colors. I get it. Play-Doh's cheap. Most people don't care. I care, okay? I do things decently and in order, all right? And there's an important distinction when it comes to Play-Doh. Don't mix the colors. And those, those crafty advertisements show all these clever little things that you put together with Play-Doh with all these colors and hamburger, little tiny hamburgers and ice cream cones and picnics and all that. It's a lie. No one can do that, especially not a two-year-old. Okay, as soon as those colors touch, they won't untouch. If you mix the colors, you do not have the original colors ever again. Now, granted, you can go pay like a dollar and get another thing. But to me, I'm cheap. So we're not doing that. We're keeping the colors separate, okay? But as soon as the two are joined together, you cannot separate it. You cannot separate. You can try. But where they have connected is something new that is not the two individual colors. It's usually some sloppy gray color, but... When anyone, lost or saved, when they become married, there is an indelible connection that if separated is no longer just what they once were. It's an indelible mark in the heart of that kind of unity because God sanctioned it. And regardless of what court systems say, a marriage between a man and a woman, they join together it's joined in such a way that to separate is not just go back to being single. And, and I, I, there's no condemnation if you're on your second marriage, okay? I, I, I promise there's no condemnation, but Jesus is being pretty darn clear. He says to take the covenant of marriage seriously and not allow legal exceptions to give you a chance to harden your heart and think that by convenience, you can just separate and it not have an impact on you. And so if we want to avoid getting to that point, he says, it's about the heart. It, divorce ended up being a concession to a hard heart. The reason for divorce is, hard, is a hard heart. Now there are Three main biblical reasons for divorce, adultery, abandonment, and abuse. Adultery in right there, the very next verse, Matthew 19, verse 9, and then abandonment, 1 Corinthians 7, roughly 12 to 18, 13 to 18. And I, I read that, that the way abandonment works is also abuse. And so, there, yeah, there are biblical reasons, but just because there are even biblical reasons doesn't mean we pull down God's standard. He says, take this seriously. And even those three things, whether or not they happened after you got married or there was already a hardening of the heart before marriage, if you end up in those three things, they're, they're coming from a hard heart. Someone, someone who is abusive has a very hard heart. You can't do that to another human being with a soft heart. You can't abandon another human being you're in relationship with, with at that covenantal level without a hard heart. And you won't commit adultery if you haven't hardened your heart. So it all comes from a hard heart. So our heart is what's most important in our marriage. And you cannot control another person's heart. You can only determine your own. You can only guard your own. You can contribute to what happens to the other person, your spouse, but you can only control your heart. <clears throat> Hannah and I got married in the age of iPhones and Facebook. So we got married the same year that the iPhone was invented and Facebook was invented. It almost seems like another lifetime, it maybe is. Um, <laughs> but like, we don't, have, we don't have a time in marriage. Like I, I remember being in, in school, I grew up without cell phones. And I'm not even that old, so, which is weird. But, um, like, I remember that to coordinate anything, you have to have, like, details. Like, at this time, I mean, this is, this is like, I've been to every Jubilee, okay? And uh, there wasn't cell phones for my parents to keep track of me, which is, which is great. But... <laughs> 
Like you had to have like very, at this time, you will be at this place. Okay, so there's lots of communication. Well, we think that technology has made communication easier, and it's not, okay? It's made it terrible. But um, even though that hasn't been that long, um, life is approximately in cycles of seven. That's even those like biblical precedent of that, but, but truly. Because there's, there's the two most frequent times for divorce, like in, in length, of, length of marriage before divorce, the two most frequent times are years one and two is the first, and the second is between years five and eight. And actually the most frequent time, more than half of the divorces, approximately 60% of the divorces that take place is in the years seven and eight. Second to that is years one and two. Because years one and two, it's a combination of honeymoon and chaos. <laughs> like it's like, World Wrestling Federation in all sorts of different ways. Like you don't know how to be married when you get married. It doesn't matter what your premarital counseling, we all do our best in premarital counseling and every single counseling session, we're just like, you guys are so clueless. Like we sometimes say that and try to give them forewarning and they think, you think you know something. You don't know anything, you are stupid. And so like the first couple years of marriage, it's just, it's just chaos. It's, 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 you don't know what it's like, especially, especially if you have adult routines. Like the, as, you, as you age, you, you just develop certain routines of living. And then when those routines collide with another human being, it's chaos. Because like, for whatever reason, God made opposites attract. And like <laughs> two different people, like, you know, it, like so, so in a lot of marriages, like one's an introvert, one's an extrovert, and they just want to like throttle each other because neither of them are happy with, they're just trying to figure this out. You know, like having anything on the schedule, like to an introvert, is just like, please stop. And then to, to have nothing on the schedule is like torture to an extrovert. Um, it, it, in couples, you know, one, one uh, strangles the toothpaste like a serial killer. The same person in the marriage. <laughs> carefully rolls it up piece by piece. And after about the fourth roll, when it starts unrolling itself, you go get a little clip. Yeah. <laughs> you clip it. That's, that is how you do it. Like, like... Maximum usage for the serial killer is like 75%. You're only going to get about 75% of that toothpaste. <laughs> That's if you're lucky. Like if you have a practiced grip. Like you'll get to 100% if you'll roll it, okay? <laughs> See, I also said I'm cheap. So like I'm all about like maximizing every, every investment. One person loads the dishwasher like a raccoon on meth. I just found out every person who loads the dishwasher that way. There's a right way, okay? <laughs> Dumping it in is not the right way. You, you know, you, listen, listen, you know, like, I also am a systems person, okay? Like, it, you know that if you'll take the silverware and if you'll put it like all spoons the same size in one container like one of the little holders, and then the next size spoon in the next level, and then one size forks in the next. When you're done, all you have to do is grab the bunch and put it in. When I have to search every crevice of the dishwasher to find all the different pieces, it's a complete waste of time. <sighs> Just, I need to get that off my chest. Like that's, that's years one and two where you're just like, I, I think I married a psychopath. <laughs> oh, the examples abound. <clears throat> um, but, but like after a couple of years, most marriages make it through the rocky, that rocky time of like honeymoon and like really great good feelings and then reality sets in and then you figure out some kind of 
way of surviving one another. Well, then, then over the course of time, you build routines. You figure out roles and responsibilities. And then you are, quote unquote, blessed with a little baby. <laughs> and that is a whole new roller coaster of one moment of just sheer elation and joy. And then when you don't sleep for two years, <laughs> you're thinking, what did I do? <laughs> like, what have we done with our lives? Uh, and so what happens, though, is you start to get complacent. And then you have kids, and roughly about seven years in, something else happens. Something changes. And you, you, when you are complacent and you're stuck in your routine, you start getting restless or distracted or bored and you stop working. What you do over the course of those seven years is one tiny little thing at a time, you harden your heart. You don't get a hard heart overnight. It comes from thousands of tiny little decisions that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis. And some people, some people, it's just sheer ignorance. Guys, <laughs> we're just, we're a combination of ignorant. You don't know better and stupid. You do know better, but you don't care. <laughs> um, learning to live with one another. I want to show you this video that this is a lot of what like marriages have to navigate in the first five years with stupid husbands. Roll it. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Gonna make dinner, I can remember. <sighs> what? I just wish you'd take some initiative and cook your own dinner for once. I've been at work too, you know, and what, now I get to come home and pack the dishwasher and then unpack the dishwasher and cook dinner and put the washing on and you know what, I can't continue to live like this because hey, it's hey, not for hey, me. Hey, relax. It's going to be all right. How? Here, I'll just show you. Okay, I've been doing this since you moved in. See this basket thing? I don't know how it happens, if it's the house or what but any dirty clothes you put in this basket, somehow the next day, they're just clean, folded, and in a perfect pile in your bed. You're not serious. I couldn't believe it at first either, but it just keeps happening. That's why I didn't tell you, I didn't want to jinx it. You are insane. Try it, you'll see. Unless it's only chosen me. <laughs> see, I don't know. I can't do this. No, wait. There's other things too. Plates, cutlery, pizza boxes, dirty tissues, anything you leave on this coffee table just vanishes overnight. It's magic. No, she wouldn't have left me. This is what I think happened. I heard her get up in the middle of the night to get a drink or something. She must have fallen onto the magic coffee table and just vanished. Are you insane? No, he's not insane. I've got the same coffee table at home. When your marriage falls apart, you still can't claim ignorance, okay? <laughs> Even though most of us men are about that stupid. Um, I, I, when my wife and I moved to Sherman, we moved to Sherman about 10 years ago, uh, we moved in uh, to, we were really blessed to, to get a great house and moved into a neighborhood that had this thing we had never experienced before called a homeowners association. <laughs> I know who lives in an HOA. So if communism is your thing, go for an HOA, all right? <laughs> it's just like, it's, that's a preview, okay? So if you're thinking commies are coming, they're taking over one HOA at a time, all right? <laughs> and there's all these different rules. And like, we're first time homeowners and um, let's just say there's a lot I don't know. And my natural state of living, like the things I naturally gravitate to are things like books, <laughs> not yard equipment. <laughs> okay, I find no delight, no joy, no relaxation in doing anything in the yard. Anything in the heat bothers me, okay? <laughs> There's like all these certain things. And apparently in some fine print somewhere, there is a certain standard for weeds. Like you're just not allowed to have a certain amount of weeds. And I didn't know this, nor did I know how to deal with weeds. 
And we got a sprinkler system that was new. I might be techie, but sprinkler systems, that's a whole new level. I can't figure out if it's on and what schedule and what days. And there was one summer, like the first summer, like I was trained on all of it and it's just one in the ear and out the other. I was like, you start quoting Dallas Willard, I'm with you. You're talking about sprinkler systems and scheduled days. I'm nodding my head and acting spiritual. Like that sounds good. Uh, I don't want to pay you anymore for being here. So, so I had, I had, there was one summer though that I forgot to turn the sprinkler systems back on. And one summer of neglect cost me three years. Three years of fines. <sighs> I've still, hang on, I just got to guard my heart for a second. <laughs> and... I had to pay professionals to take care of this. And they might've been like snowing me and like, this will take three years to do because, well, I have to pay them to keep doing it. So it took me three years to get it back in order. And I just got so sick and tired of a monthly letter. Like there's only so much I can do about weeds that are here, okay? And they didn't appreciate my response, but, and I didn't pay their fines eventually. I just said, tough, I'm trying, get over it. That's how you stand up to commies, okay? So I learned a very important lesson, okay? Paying attention and consistent acts of maintenance will save so much more time and so much more effort and so much more money than one summer, we're talking three months of neglect. And most of us will treat our marriage that way. We'll neglect for months, maybe years, and then the problem gets really big and you start paying the quote unquote fines. And now you're like, oh my goodness, what do I do? And it's gonna take you years to come back from that outside of a divine intervention. It could take you a long time to get back what you're neglecting. And so when it comes to our hearts, we're, we're, we're called to guard our hearts and that has to be done consistently and we're to guard our hearts in the context of marriage. Again, what Jesus says, they are no longer two but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. We're not just talking about the end result of splitting like divorce. We're talking about all the tiny little things that cause disconnection between the two of us. That is one tiny little separation in our heart from one another. That our hearts are, should be joined together and we're called to guard those hearts. But then disappointment, unmet expectations, outbursts of anger, prolonged frustration. All of those things begin to disconnect us And so I I think what Jesus is saying, let no one disconnect what God has connected. God has connected our hearts, but we can allow circumstances and our feelings and our responses to take tiny little microscopic disconnections. But then they start having compound interest and we allow disconnection after disconnection after disconnection. And that's one tiny little incremental hardening of the heart. And then over time, that disconnection gets to the point where you have, maybe we should consider divorce. You did not get there overnight. And so we have to pay attention to the things that foster disconnection, things like neglect, apathy, things like domination or control, trying to control one another. And that sounds extreme, but here's the deal. Things like sarcasm are the vast majority of the time little ways we're trying to manipulate behavior. We're trying to manipulate the other person's feelings, hoping that the the, the manipulation of their feelings will manipulate their actions. Things like passive aggressive comments. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, in communication, you have to learn uh, people's natural tendencies and styles, and, and we'll often call it silence or violence. That when, when, there's, when there's something, there's a disagreement, some people respond to that disagreement by 
anger and trying to dominate the conversation through anger and then dominate the other person to get their way. And some people use silence to protect themselves. And just those simple things, it's fostering disconnection. Going to silence or violence, using the silent treatment to get your way. You're not going to get your way in case you didn't know that. Um, Using punishment or retaliation. Those don't have to be big things. They can be tiny, small little things. You didn't know that? You don't, you, you, have you not thought through all the tiny ways we, if we're not paying attention, we use punishing our spouse with or withholding something from our spouse? One-upsmanship or comparison. When one person is common in marriage, especially if you've got young kids, you know, uh, maybe the husband who tends to be, this is not universal, but tends to be the one who's not as quick to let out their heart. Many times in many marriages, that's, that's, that can be reversed, okay? That many times it's the husband's that's really free with their heart and the wife withholds. But chances are, ten, more than 50%, it's, it's guys that are like little boys and they don't know how to let their heart out. And so it's super scary to let a tiny bit of their heart out. And so they'll, they'll, they'll come home struggling with something, like something at work. And just like, you know, honey, I had a hard day at work. You had a hard day at work. I've been here with your kids. You should hear all the, it's like a one-upsmanship. And when you do that, you can guarantee your husband or your wife, if you're in that one-upsmanship, you've guaranteed they're not ready to open their heart again anytime soon. You've told them when you open your heart, when you try to reach for heart connection, you're gonna be punished by comparison. And if you're, if, you're, if you're lucky and you're both pursuing God, the Lord will start working on both of you and keep you from hardening the heart or keep you from being a jerk. But like, we got a responsibility to each other to show love. And again, like, those, the, like one of those things are not going to lead you to divorce, but one of those things unchecked will start compounding. And if you've punished your spouse for opening their heart and you don't recognize what you've done, they start withholding their heart and days turn to weeks and weeks turn to months. They've hardened your heart and you've hardened your heart and now you've split apart. You've started to disconnect what God has connected. And if we don't learn to practice this in our marriages, we're not gonna be able to do this to the body of Christ. Like we're called to love one another. Romans chapter 12, the, the beginning of, from nine to the end of the chapter, Paul is talking about, hey, in the community of faith, this is how we're to treat one another. These are the things that are appropriate behaviors for, for people who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the character of Christ gets embodied in his body, then it will look like these things. And he begins with, let your love be genuine or without hypocrisy or sincere is some translations. Let it be genuine. Let it be real. You're not being pretentious about your love. And then he says, abhor what is evil. Start recognizing what is evil. And we have to look at all the tiny things we allow evil in our own hearts or in our marriages. Abhor that. You're supposed to pay attention to what what is good, hold fast to that. And then anything that is not good, you are to abhor it. You're to avoid it. You're to push it away. And you have to practice that in your marriage. And that word Agape, the word love there, to let your agape be genuine, is to will the good for another and act for that good. It's not based in feeling. It's not based in circumstance. It's to will the good. You got to know the good that is for another person. It's to will their good and act for that good. It involves action. And that has to be genuine. Would that not need to be expressed in our marriages? That we will the good for our spouse. 
And then we consistently and persistently act for that good without demanding reciprocity. <laughs> you might have heard the phrase, uh, sex does not begin in the bedroom, it begins in the kitchen. And I'm not talking about getting spicy in the, chi in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm talking about doing the dishes. But many times you can be like, I'm sowing, I'm sowing, I'm consistently sowing. Where's the reaping? <laughs> and if you don't check your heart, your actions of love might not be genuine. They might be self-oriented. I'm doing this because of what I'll get for it. And the way, the way, you'll, the way you'll know if that's your motive, because you might not even know that's your motive, when it has no observable results. You can't observe that it's actually positively affecting your spouse. Because if you experience disappointment, you probably did it for the wrong motive. All right, all right, I'm talking to myself. Things like uncovering your spouse, uncovering your spouse. How many how many prayer circles are nothing more than gossip sessions? I'm going to tell you all the dirt and then say, would you just be praying for it? Or men, you're more likely to talk negative about your spouse to your friends. That's uncovering them. Criticism. I think I'm touching a nerve. All right, then verse 10, he says, love one another with brotherly affection. Love one another. That's a different word for love. It talks about how we consistently behave towards one another and how we're drawn to one another. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I like the ESV's translation of this because it shows how there's, there's a posture in our honor. It isn't a passive like you should honor one another. There's a proactive honoring that we're called to. And it's the one time in the New Testament, I could be wrong about this, is the one time in the New Testament I can find the thing we're called to be competitive about. I can't find anything else that is, you're allowed to be competitive about. The one thing that we are admonished to be competitive about is how well we can beat each other at honoring each other. We're called to honor our spouse. And that's hard because like, I, I, I mean, I talk for a living and part of communication is telling stories. And I have them. <laughs> but since I'm the one that gets to tell the story, I can make myself the hero of every story. You don't have to know how close to the truth it is. If I'm a somewhat believable person, then like, and there's a way that I can tell stories in the name of being vulnerable and honest and totally uncover and throw my wife under the bus. I can dishonor her in the name of being truthful and honest and vulnerable and showing how imperfect we are. I'm actually throwing her under the bus and making myself look really good. All that is, it's, it's, it's taking the two that is one and putting just a little wedge, a little tiny little wedge in there and then uncheck that wedge, force its way deeper and deeper and begin to disconnect or separate what God has joined together. And that happens in each other's hearts. Ephesians chapter four, verse 17, or sorry, verse 29, the apostle Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. If that is what we're supposed to be doing for one another in the body of Christ, where's the place that we should be practicing this the most? It's in our marriages. And you could say then by extension with our children, 
let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but such as is good for building up. How are we speaking to our kids? How are we speaking to our spouse? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. You, it, it, if, if I could just listen to you talk for a little while in a non-pretentious way, you might be putting on a pretension, but if I could listen to you, we can find out what's in your heart. <laughs> well, I could probably just say it this way. I could ask your spouse, how does your spouse talk? And then we can find out where their heart is. Is it hardened to one another? Then look, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Man, apparently... There's many things that can and do grieve the Holy Spirit, but apparently right connected to grieving the Holy Spirit is the words that are coming out of our mouth, how we talk to one another. Would we not want the, 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 the presence and power of the Holy Spirit being fostered in the covenant relationship we have with our spouse? Well, then we don't wanna grieve him. What will grieve him? How we talk to one another. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Those are heart conditions and conditions of the heart that work their way into actions and words. In context, if you jump up to verse 17, 18, and 19, he talks about how we came to Christ in a description of those who do not know Christ. And one of the ways he describes those who do not know Christ is their hard hearts. And he says, you're not to live that way anymore. What way? With a hard heart. And that's when he talks about, you have to put off the old self, which is corrupt with its deceitful desires. You have to put that off. Part of putting that off is you have, you have to recognize that there's no allowance for a hard heart. Like there's not an exception in scripture to go, don't harden your hearts, except when your spouse is a jerk. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Not hard, we're called to not be hard-hearted, we're to keep a tender heart to one another. And how do you come back from a hard heart? forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the condition of a lot of marriages is some variation of a hard heart. How do you come back from a hard heart? It begins, it doesn't end, but it begins with forgiveness. The thing that you've hardened your heart towards your spouse over is the thing that Jesus forgave 2000 years ago on the cross when he shed his blood. That's what he says, as God in Christ forgave you. God forgave you of everything before it happened. You weren't alive 2,000 years ago. So every sin that you've committed was future tense from the cross. And every sin that your spouse has committed against you, Jesus has already forgiven. The thing we've hardened our heart concerning is the thing Jesus shed his blood to forgive. And so the marriage relationship should be the safest place to open our heart. And we're to treat the opening of each other's heart with tender care and kindness. Make it safe for your spouse to open their heart. Things to foster connection. Eye contact. This doesn't have to be complicated. One of the things I appreciate about Jim last night is he's like, all that thing that you've made it complicated, stop it. I, like, I love the Michael Jordan meme. Stop it. Get help. That's the solution to most people's problems. Stop it. Get help. Let's start with something simple. Eye contact. When your spouse is talking, treat them more important than this thing. Now, we can say that these things are the worst things on the planet and all that, but here's the deal. Before that was a television and dudes are notorious for plopping themselves on the couch and flipping and demanding their spouse serve them. Stop it, get help. <laughs> I remember 
One of the, one of the most important lessons of the first couple of years of marriage. I was watching basketball because that's the sport you watch. I was watching basketball and my wife, this is before we had kids, came, sat down on the couch and was wanting to talk. And it was, it was something pretty tender, but not like super serious. And so um, I actually had at one time the ability to hear and memorize information and yet not break my attention. And so she's talking and I'm watching the game and I'm not, I'm not even responding. I'm not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, because I, she's important to me. She's my wife. So I've got an ear. <laughs> and she's like, hey, you're not listening. And I said, hold up. And I repeated to her the last 60 seconds of what she said. And then I had this epiphany. (laughs) Apparently, memorizing information is not the same thing as listening. (laughs) So I learned my lesson. It did not take long. It's like, I listen, so I'm going to make eye contact with you. I'm going to listen, and I'm not just going to memorize information. This This is what I learned in that and many other times I've messed up, that there's a difference between listening and tolerating the other person talking. Especially if you don't have a lot of skills for listening and you're like, okay, I want to do better. Uh Uh-huh. 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 That's what a lot of people's listening. It's just, they're just tolerating the other person talking. So make eye contact, listen, and then reflect. Don't just memorize information and repeat it. Reflect. This is what I'm hearing. Is this what you're saying? Um, non-sexual affection, that does exist. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering, men, praise. Instead of criticism, praise. What's rewarded is repeated. If there's anything, 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 anything worthy of praise, think on these things and to your spouse, verbalize it. That was <laughs> so much more. And here's... Uh, let me end in First Thessalonians 5. Here's, here's probably forgiveness, I think, is the first step towards unhardening the heart, softening the heart. But I think one of the most important practices we can commit to consistently that'll keep the heart soft is gratitude. First Thessalonians 5, 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. Stop trying to retaliate to your spouse or one-upsmanship, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. If we can't practice that consistently in our marriage, we're never going to let that overflow to the body of Christ. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, let's remember the words of Jesus in our marriage. Let no one separate or split apart what God has joined together. Don't let your feelings, your emotions, don't let the enemy work in those tiny little wedges that we're tempted to allow to disconnect us in marriage. We keep a tender heart with one another, forgive our spouse and consistently forgive our spouse and recognize if there's a problem, it's you. And then the way we practice maintaining a soft heart, give thanks even in tough times, even if you think your, your, your marriage is too far gone, actively and aggressively search for one thing you can be grateful for, just one thing. If the dude picks up his clothes one time and puts it in the hamper, praise it, thank him for it. If he does dishes one time, if, 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 he just, if he's never put dishes in the sink, start there. Just because he didn't rinse, wipe, get it in the dishwasher and unload the dishwasher doesn't mean you can't be grateful for getting a cup or a plate in the sink, okay? Start small and let's keep connected and let's keep our hearts soft. We keep our hearts soft towards one another in marriage. It'll overflow towards our children. It overflows in our family. It'll overflow into the body of Christ. And then we can actually be what Jesus prayed, one, as he and the father are one. Because that's what he's after. This right here is practicing a unity and oneness that we're called to have 
as the whole body of Christ.